Good morning, Anissa. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to get started. Welcome to, welcome, uh, oh, we have one more person coming in. All right, we're going to get started. Once again, thank you for joining us for this exciting lecture, presentation in honor of the annual observance of Black History Month, also known as African American History Month. Today we have our presenter, Ms. Peggy Barton, has prepared a delightful, engaging presentation that is deserving of our attention. Uh, now, before we get started, just please make sure that you're on mute. And also, this presentation will be recorded for university purposes and educational purposes. Moving forward, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Um, if you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat, and we will, put, and we will address it at the end of the presentation. Um, one more comment, person coming in from the waiting room. Overall, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to transition it over to Ms. Peggy Barton. Ms. Peggy, whenever you're ready. Okay. Thank you, Emma. Good morning and welcome to our OLLI presentation, Celebrating Black History Month. During this time of revolution and uprising, Amidst a global pandemic, understanding our collective American story feels more critical than ever. Travel cannot be divorced from the context of the places we visit. There is a countrywide unlearning and reckoning with the history of the United States, particularly how the contribution of Blacks and other communities of color have been negated and repackaged in a white systematic racist framework. As a travel community, we're learning about the creation of our country and seeking, seeking deeper experiences beyond the typical tourist traps. Furthermore, we are connecting with the people who make us want to visit these places. So that's why today I'm going to tell the tale of two beaches called Inkwell. When you hear that name, what are the first images that come to your mind? If you think negative stereotypes, you are correct. The term inkwell was in reference to the skin color of the beachgoers. History suggests white Americans probably first used the controversial term inkwell to describe more than one leisure beach site around the United States associated with African Americans during the Jim Crow era. Inkwell is the name of the beach located on the island of Martha's Vineyard in Oak Bluff. This is the first beach we're going to go to today. This popular beach frequented by African Americans began in the late 19th century. The beach original name was Town Beach. It is the most famous inkwell of the beaches across the United States to transform this odious nickname into an emblem of pride. To start part one of this tale, we're going to the East Coast and board a ferry in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Some of the pictures you will see on my, was from my trip to Cape Cod and Martha's Vineyard back in 2018. Your trip from Falmarth to Oak Bluff is just 35 minutes. Enjoy your enclosed lounge or our outside decks. Have a cup of chowder or relax with a cocktail. Our crew goes out of their way to make you feel welcome. Well, that's what they told us on our trip to Martha's Vineyard. The picture here you see are my friends that I traveled with back in 2018. Uh, let's see, it's Stanley, Nell, Carol, and Eddie. We all had a great time. Here we are at Oak Bluff. Now we're going to go back in time when Martha's Vineyard entered the 20th century. Two African-Americans arrived in Oak Bluff. Each made a lasting impression on the town and the tiny African-American community, which had fewer than 150 inhabitants in 1900. The first important individual 
was the Reverend Oscar Denniston, all citizens. He, he built the Bradley Memorial Church. Reverend Denniston was known to say this when he first came there. He helped bring into reality in his generation the conception of America as a land of opportunity, brotherhood, and democracy. And he further said, I didn't come here to become rich, but I came here to build a church. In his first years on the island, Reverend Dennison assisted Mrs. Susan Bradley in her missionary work at what was then called the Oakland Mission Hall in Oak, Oak Bluff. The building was built in 1895 as part of the expansion of Cottage City around the Wesleyan Grove campgrounds. It was renamed to Bradley Memorial Church after Mrs. Bradley passed. Bradley Memorial was a place of humanity, tolerance, love, and brotherhood. It was a modest building where people of all faiths attended religious services, where immigrants learned English on their road to citizenship, where the island's black community gathered on summer evenings for services, where generations were linked by fellowship and worship. Reverend Dennison was the pastor of Bradley Memorial Church until he passed in 1942. There was another very famous religious retreat, retreat at Oak Bluff, formerly known as the Wesleyan Grove Martha's Vineyard Camp Meeting Association, a religious camp movement started by the Egertown Methodist Church in the 1840s. A semicircle of tents, sorry, I was gonna try to bring that up so you can see it. Ah, I did it the wrong way, sorry. Technology. As you can see, the picture on the left with the semicircle of tents is where the attendees would stay at for, when they first started. By 1868, there were 570 tents. In the 19th century, between 1859 and 1864, the Martha's Vineyard cottages appeared. Methodists began gathering together on Martha's Vineyard for summer retreats in pursuit of revival and renewal. There were African Americans who owned and rented cottages for a number of years in the campgrounds. The campgrounds history has been a contradiction, contradiction in terms of race relations. There are reference in the camp meeting journals where in 1844, attendees raised $50 for a black mother to purchase her son's freedom from slavery. Frederick Douglass spoke at the campgrounds in 1876. Evidence that segregation existed in the campground is reflected in the board's minutes, how they would deny leases and rental applications to certain individuals without stating any reason. Some white residents objected to renters based on being colored. In 1962, the campground found itself to be the subject of a legal complaint filed with the Massachusetts Attorney General and its practice discriminated against people who were not Caucasians. In the 19th century, between 1859 and 1864, the, Martha Vineyard, excuse me, the Martha's Vineyard cottages appeared, remarkable for their unique architecture form as considered an invention of the local carpenters. The reason why they had the pointed roofs is because they copied the the tent formation of the original retreat. Most of the cottages built were small and painted bright colors. There were about 40 cottages in 1864, 250 in 1869, and 500 by 1880. Today, there are approximately 318 cottages remaining. As you may have noticed, Martha's Vineyard started attracting people outside of the island. Initially, the retreats were intended to be exclusively religious in purpose, but eventually they became more social with attendees flocking to experience the chance to revitalize body and spirit. The second important in individual in my story is Charles Scherer, 
born 1854 into slavery in Virginia. Charles was able to escape slavery during the Civil War, secretly joining the Union troops and settled in Hampton, Virginia, where he later went to school in Hampton Institute and met his wife, Henrietta. Both became teachers. Charles would visit Cottage City on Oak Bluff to attend Baptist revivals. Charles and his wife loved the island and purchased their first property in the late 1800s. In August of 1903, he purchased Terra Cottage, the first inn for Black vacationers. In 1912, Charles and Henrietta built a 12-room home on their property. It was at this time that they opened a summer inn, Shira Cottage, which catered to African-Americans who at that time were not welcome as guests at other island establishments. Henrietta's horse and wagon were used to transport guests. Shira Cottage was the beginning of the expansion of the African-American community in Oak Bluff on Martha's Vineyard. Shearer Cottage had a roster of Black guests, many of whom were nationally known. These guests included the talented singer and actress Ethel Waters, Paul Roberson, a former and activist, Adam Clayton Powell, Jr., U.S. Congressman, Dr. Solomon Carter Fuller, acknowledged as the first African-American psychiatrist, and his wife, Meta Wal Walrick Fuller, well-known sculpture composer and arranger, Harry T. Burleigh, who preserved Black spirituals by putting them into print. Madam C.J. Walker, hair care entrepreneur and first female to become a millionaire by her own achievement. These were only a few that stayed at Shearer Cottage at its beginning, and some of them went on later on to build their own homes in Martha's Vineyard. In August 1998, Dorothy West died on Martha's Vineyard. The Boston-born writer was the last living member of the Harlem Renaissance, a movement of African-American artists, writers, and musicians that energized American culture in the 1920s. Although profoundly influenced by her years in New York, West was strongly tied to Massachusetts, to the exclusive society of Boston's Black Brahmins or we might call him Bougie, in which he was raised and, and lived in Martha's Vineyard town of Oak Bluff, where she spent her idyllic childhood summers, <laughs> and where she lived for the last half of her life, from her cottage in Oak Bluff and the former Methodist revival camp that became the nation's first black resort. West wrote stories and novels that illuminated the class and color consciousness she observed firsthand in African-American society there on Martha's Vineyard. She was one of the last surviving members of the Harlem Renaissance. When asked what she wanted her legacy to be, she would respond with, that I hung in there, that I didn't say I can't. This is a picture of a monument, stone monument, in front of her house, as it's part of the African American Heritage Trail of Martha's Vineyard. Right here is her cottage on Martha's Vineyard, where that um, the little monument stands. Here is a picture of her with Hillary Clinton just before she passed in the late 90s, giving her a literary award there at Martha's Vineyard. And here is a picture of her in her youth. She was also a mentor or mentee, well, let me phrase this. She was mentored by Zora Neale Hurston during the Harlem Renaissance. In 1943, Miss West moved permanently to Martha's Vineyard where her parents had owned a holiday home. It was while living there and working in the billing department at the Vineyard Cassette, West began a column on people, events, and her beloved haunts in and around Oak Bluff. She was certainly the voice of Black society on the Vineyard. She would finally publish her best known novel, The Living is Easy. And then after a gap of almost a half a century, the wedding. 
In 1995, when Wes was in her 80s, West writing fame arrived in the 1990s when Oprah Winfrey produced a two-part television movie of The Wedding. Despite the long break between these two published, published works, West continued to balance writing and caring commitment with, towards the elderly relatives during her years there out of the public eye. Movies and TV shows inspired by the resort town of Oak Bluff included Inkwell, a 1994 romantic comedy drama set in 1976 with stars Lawrence Tate, Joe Martin, Glenn Turman, Jada Pickett. The film followed the adventures of Drew Tate, an autistic 16-year-old from upstate New York, when he and his family spent time with their affluent relatives on Martha's Vineyard, who are Republicans. And Drew dad, Drew's dad was a former Black Panther. I could just imagine their discussions. The Wedding is a 1998 television film series based on the 1995 novel by Dorothy West. It stars Holly Berry, Lynn Whitfield, and others. It was produced by Oprah Winfrey. The story touched on the subject of marriage, race, prejudice, class, and a family in the 1950s. Martha's Vineyard. Jumping the Broom, 2011 American romantic comedy drama produced by Tracy Edmonds and P.D. Jakes. The title of the film is derived from the Black American tradition of the bride and groom jumping over a ceremonial broom after being married. The film used a broomstick wedding to explore the intersection of class, race, and culture in the United States. Just like the books and writings of Dorothy West, there is an overarching theme of classism and culture in these three movies, depicting everyday lifestyles of American, Black American families in Martha's Vineyard. This is an interview done with Dorothy West, uh, where she recalls her earliest memories living at Oak Bluff. I'm going to show the close captions because she speaks with a very fast, half out Bostonian and New Yorker accents. And as you're listening to this, pay attention to her biases and her feelings of the vineyard during the, her youth. When I was in the first grade, I went to a school with first generation Irish. And my point being, you and I came along in the day when it said Irish not allowed and all that sort of thing, you see. So that therefore they called me nigger, which is understandable. So the, my first recollection of the vineyard is thought, I was only a child. I thought there was always summer here. There was never any school here for you to have to go to and be called nigger. When you are a child uh, and you come here, you don't know that the trees are bare here. Do you see? It is always summer and you have a good time and your mother lets you go to the beach by yourself and you go to walk downtown at night by yourself. And I remember when we were children, there was a house, and it's so interesting to me, Ed Brooks' house was the Morningstar house. And when we were children, uh, the hurdy gurdy man used to go over there because he knew he was going to get plenty of pennies or quarters from them. And we little poor children, uh, we knew we weren't rich, but we didn't feel poor. So we used to go over there and listen to the hurdy gurdy man. But we went to the beach. We, we went to Highland Beach. You asked me about the, the Bostonians and the blacks. Sometimes the, the Bostonians boast, the black Bostonians, perhaps the whites too, boast a little to the New Yorkers that they were the original settlers on the island. And I must say, I remember when it started, Harry T. Billy was a composer. And many of the spirituals that you hear, he was the one who went south and, and, and heard these spirituals and preserved them, put them to music and one thing and another. Well, my point is, he was from New York and he came here every summer because he knew many Bostonians and fell in love with the island and then began telling the New Yorkers what a lovely place it was. Then they, then they began to uh, come down to the island. But the original people were Bostonians and, as I said, when, when the little colony grew, it grew to about 12 families. Now, we went on the beach and we sat. Now, as I said, half the things I say with gentle fun, I mean, you know, uh, we would sit on the beach and we behaved well. Then the New Yorkers came. Then the New Yorkers began to come because, as I told you, Harry Bailey told them about the island. We sat quietly on the beach 
the New Yorkers came, they had never, they will kill me for this, they had never had such freedom because, you see, you had the whole island here, and whereas the various beaches they had come from, they had a section, do you see? But here you could drive up the Gay Head, you could go all over, you see, you could go to the South Beach and one thing or another. So they had never had such freedom, and and they wouldn't like that expression. But at any rate, and of course, it's so, so much as part, but the women wore, they were good-looking women in good-looking clothes, uh, but they had paint on their faces. And only uh, sporting women, I think was the phrase, only sporting women. <laughs> that was a euphemism for, for, for kept women. Uh, and so they had paint on, and the, smoke cigarettes. The women smoked cigarettes. But even worse than that, you see, they were boarding, and they wanted to stay on the beach all day. So they had food in baskets, and mostly chicken. Chicken, I think, travels well in baskets. But you see, we have a reputation for eating chicken and watermelon. <laughs> So that there they were, and we said, they're going to lose the beach for us, they're going to lose the beach. And I swear to God, one summer we came down and said, private. <laughs>
This is something, two models that we could take on, especially today. This informal group has been in existence for over 75 years, with no constitution, bylaws, or formal organization structure. The only thing that glues them together is a caring friendship. <clears throat> All polar bears are not the same. There are three types of bears that meet at 7.30 in the morning. There are the swimming bears, the non-swimming bears, the bear watchers and talkers, and the exercise bears. They form a friendship circle in the water to work out. Though no statistical data has been collected, some say the average age of the polar bear is 65. Just think about that. A lot of us on this Zoom, we could qualify. We could go and swim with the polar bears. To quote Betty Foster Baker from an article in the Vineyard Gazette, I saw the polar bears in the context of shared history, repeating itself over time. Then there was this connection to water and its relevance in the biblical sense of water as a cleanser, rejuvenator, and healer in the African-American baptismal experience. It surfaced as a tie that binds, underpins by a conviction in the value of inclusiveness, that expands the boundaries of diversity, transcends physical conditions, color, race, or belief, transforming microscopic reality of what America might be. Next picture is I'm going to share is from a friend of mine in Maryland, Fred Blunt, who was, was going to use his own narrative, but because of technical difference, difficulties, I'm going to share his narrative for the pictures that he took when he was staying at Martha's Vineyard. So these are the words of my friend, Fred Blunt. With each passing year, I look to do something different. As I shared some of my thoughts with a friend, I learned about an annual neighborhood event at the Martha's Vineyard. When they come together at the end of the summer season. This event is an annual gathering of friends and family who live and own summer homes in Oak Bluff during the Columbus Day weekend. This is an art sale or an art expo of historical sites around Oak Bluff. Such as a picture of the ink well and polar bears, landscape views of gingerbread cottages and crafts and jewelry, all done by local merchants and residents of the vineyard. Along the side of the Inkwell beach, friends and families gathered to share food and drinks, such as much like a potluck. I was able to help in the activities by setting up the tables. Soul foods such as macaroni and cheese, greens, fried fish, fried chicken, pies, cookies, and cakes were on the table. The truck you see was used as a bar. Volunteers served as bartenders. The best thing of all, this was all free. I enjoyed this Oak Bluff reunion where everyone who came together to say their goodbyes and give their promise to reunite at the same time next year. This was relaxing and I spent quality time with everyone in attendance. I can say that I appreciate the hospitality of friends who I envy greatly who stay on the vineyard for the entire year. I wanna thank my friend, Mr. Blunt for sharing his pictures with me. And I wanna share one more quote. Inkwell was known as the gathering place for the black elite. But what's important is that all the people who come here, regardless of what class they are thought to belong to, are people of substance and who come here because our substance is spiritual substance. And I, here I listed some of my resources that I use, the book I bought at Martha's Vineyard. The Vineyard Gazette has been in existence since Martha's Vineyard Vineyard has been there. And I got a lot of great information there from the New Yorker and then the African American Heritage Trail, Marcus Vineyard. Again, special thanks to Fred Blunt sharing his pictures. And that's the end of my tale, part one, Inkwell. 
You'll have to come back for part two, West Coast style, on Thursday, February 18th, 11 a.m. Now you bring your sunglasses, and that's the end. And at this point, I, uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Hema, and we will have questions or any statements you'd like to make.